locks and keys in video games are everywhere and have been around for quite some time. Series like The Legend of Zelda are known for their dungeons where literal keys are needed to progress past locked doors. But keys and locks don't have to be literal keys and locks. In Super Metroid, many areas are at first inaccessible to the player, but acquiring an ability like the Ice Beam allows the player to freeze enemies and use them as platforms to reach previously unreachable areas meaning we can see the ice beam as the key to unlock the doors, which are the previously untraversable gaps. In the previous example of A Link to the Past, in addition to the literal keys and doors, many of the items the player collects are also keys to progressing in the game, like how the hookshot allows Link to traverse gaps that were previously impassable. I've created a simple platform game prototype that we can use to explore how we can employ the lock and key pattern in a fun way when building our levels and demonstrate which pitfalls to avoid. Our lock and key in this example consists of a closed gate and a purple crystal that opens the gate when struck by the player's sword or arrow. If we move the crystal in the potential path of the player before reaching the gate, it's possible for the player to find our key before we ever show them the lock. If the player finds the key before the lock, the whole thing tends to feel pretty trivial. Or the player doesn't recognize the key at first, walking right past it and later feels punished for missing it, though it wasn't their fault. Let's instead make sure our player sees the lock first. From the gate, we create a branching path that leads the player to our key. This will create an incentive for the player to explore, as well as primes them to look for potential keys that fit the lock. But we've now created an additional problem for ourselves. After finding the key, the player needs to backtrack all the way to the lock. We'll add a shortcut for the player from the crystal to the gate. Forcing the player to repeatedly backtrack through the same environments without offering a new challenge or experience can quickly become boring and frustrating, so it's usually best to keep this to a minimum whenever possible. Simply adding locks and keys to a layout does not necessarily make it more interesting, but can feel like added busywork to pad the runtime of your game. Let's add a challenge to a layout in a form of collapsing platforms paired with flying enemies. Now, reaching the key provides a tangible gameplay challenge, making it less trivial and more of an achievement to complete and be able to progress. I'll add a coin pickup behind the door as a reward for the player, even though in this prototype it doesn't really do anything, at least for now. Adding rewards for unlocking new areas or overcoming challenges will make the player's progression feel extra satisfying. A visually interesting environment, story progression, or simply opening up new challenges for the player are also valid rewards for progressing past one of your locks. In addition to our more literal lock and key, let's add a lock in the form of a path to a new area that is currently out of reach of the player. Our key will be in the form of a wall jump ability that the player can unlock somewhere in their current gameplay area. I'll quickly block out an area to obtain the wall jump ability and reserve space for something of a boss fight to provide the player with a good challenge to overcome in order to unlock the wall jump ability. Let's again add a shortcut back to the location of the lock. I'll lay out the shortcut in a way that the player is required to immediately use their new key, the wall jump, so we as designers can be absolutely sure that the player now knows how to use the new ability. In this example, we're just using a placeholder pickup to unlock the ability. But when designing your game, please try to integrate your keys and locks into the game's narrative and world as much as possible to keep your world immersive. Where locks and keys, for the sake of having them, can feel like padding your game, when we revisit previous level sections we built, we can see that the reward of the keys in the form of player abilities or items can have a big impact on the gameplay itself allowing the player to deal with combat or traversal setups more easily or just in a new and interesting way. 
If we go for a less linear, more metroidvania style layout, we can even introduce the wall jump lock earlier on in our layout. This foreshadows the lock and key for a longer time, building up anticipation, but also gives the player more agency in their exploration after unlocking the double jump key. One of the great benefits of locks and keys is that we can organize our game's content in a controlled way. We can lock a player out of challenges that would be way too difficult early in the game or that would be frustrating as they wouldn't have the tools yet to solve these kind of challenges. We can also make sure players don't obtain specific other upgrades too early, like the double jump ability in this case. If the player would acquire it early on, it would make our carefully planned lock and key section to acquire the wall jump trivially easy. Keep in mind that all of these principles are not written in stone. Different game projects require different approaches and solutions, and when you know the rules, you should be free to break them when it makes for a better gameplay experience. But hopefully, I've given you some insight in how the lock and key design pattern is often used in level design. If this was in any way useful or interesting, you could greatly help me out by liking the video and possibly subscribing to my YouTube channel. This type of support really encourages me to create more level design content and hopefully will allow me to dedicate more time to this in the future. Thank you very much for watching and see you in the next video.